But the fact is, everybody at the end of the day wants their brains to work better, and everybody has points in their life where they need to get to get more from uh, get more from the limited time that they have to learn or to train or whatever. And we're we're learning so fast, so much about how this works that five years from now we're going to know exactly the the waveform to deliver that is best for whatever whatever category of stuff you want to learn bulletproof radio a state of high performance you're listening to bulletproof radio with dave asprey today's cool fact of the day is that clumps of cells in laboratory petri dishes just spontaneously formed brain waves. These little lentil-sized clusters, uh, by the way, these are lentils without lectins, apparently, uh, of nerve cells. That was a super geeky diet joke. If you didn't get that, you'd have to read the Bulletproof Diet, sorry. Anyway, these nerve cells, about the size of dumb little beans, grow in a lab dish, and they start firing off rhythmic electrical signals and those oscillations have some of the same features that we have in our own developing human brains as babies. These are little three-dimensional spheres of human brain cells. They're called cerebral organoids, and they're super simplistic models of the human brain. And in this study, researchers at UC San Diego coax stem cells into forming some of the neurons that make up the outer layer of the brain. And that's pretty fascinating neuroscience, but it makes you wonder, at what point does your brain become your brain? In this case, each of these organoids is about a million times smaller than a human brain. It lacks the complex combination of cells that help shape neural waves in people. They're not miniature brains, but just a model for a brain. But no one can tell you why they started doing that. So there's some questions at the very fundamental nature of consciousness, uh, neuroscience, and human existence. You know, where do you draw the line? I don't really know, but I also know Plants are smart too, and that's why I eat them. Today's episode is a special episode recorded live in San Francisco at the headquarters of Halo Neuro because we're going to talk about electrical stimulation of the brain. I figured what better place to do that. And if you're interested in brains and performing well and things like that, you definitely want to check out Superhuman, my new book. It is just, just out there as we're recording the show. And you'll find really, really good value for you, especially if you realize that one in 10 people are likely to die of Alzheimer's. And what if there were ways to take care of your brain? What if there were ways to exercise your brain? Well, we're going to talk about some of the things you can do to make your brain stay young. And on my website, daveasprey.com, you can actually see a picture of my brain response time that says I'm responding with a 20 year old speed, even though I'm 46. Maybe some of the neurostimulation that we're gonna talk about today is part of how I do that. Maybe it's just ping pong, maybe it's mitochondrial enhancement. I don't really know, but you're gonna learn a lot of cool stuff in today's episode. And it's really cool to be able to pick the brain of someone who's really looked at engineering and neuroscience where they come together. So I'm gonna be interviewing the co-creator of Halo Sport, which is the world's first convenient wearable neurostimulator for athletes specifically. You might have seen videos of me doing a ladder training, which I'm super not experienced in, with a halo on my head. And I actually use this thing at home all the time. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Brett Wingeyer, a PhD, CTO, co-founder of Halo, and a guy who's going to blow your mind. Thanks, Dave, and, uh, and, and thanks for coming to Halo. It's really awesome to have you here. I was hoping you would completely freak out when I said you're going to blow my mind because you're actually running electricity across it. Yeah, that, 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 that's what we're all about. D we, didn't push any buttons for you. It didn't push any. No, no triggers here. No triggers. So, 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 Dave, what, uh, what, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to talk about making brains better, and that's at, at, as you know, that's just about one of the most important things that we could possibly talk about. So, we're going to talk about coffee, pretty much, because that's well, what it makes. So, so I, 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 I love <laughs> coffee. Let, like, let's let's just get that out there. <laughs> totally I, kidding. I love coffee. So, I, if I, it, we could talk about coffee for an hour, and that'd be fantastic. Okay. Uh, that that would be my frontline technology for making the brain better. But the reason I wanted to pick your brain today was you know something about learning. And I know that people listening to Bulletproof Radio are interested in learning faster and just spending less time and energy getting stuff done. And since learning is a fact of life, we're all doing it all the time, what if you can acquire skills faster than normal? So 
explain to me some of the the history of what we know about how we learn and why you got interested in this in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so brains love to learn, and that that's one of these fundamental things. It's neuroplasticity. That's what a brain does: is it optimizes itself to get the job done. And the way that's happening under the hood is your brain cells are firing. That's that's what they do. They fire together, and they're they're constantly forming stronger and weaker connections that help them work together in exactly the right networks for exactly the right output. And what do we mean what do we mean by output? You know, that could mean um, the perfect backhand. It could mean the perfect uh, the perfect ping pong overhand spin shot, or it could mean learning a language. It's all about your brain optimizing itself to get the job done. I had a conversation with my son. Uh, he's 10. And he said, Daddy, what is the fastest way to learn something? Or what is the best teacher? And I, I thought about it and I said, gravity. And he said, what? And I said, because if you fall down, it hurts and you won't do it again. So the, the point that I was teaching was, look, avoiding pain is something that we're wired into. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the first thing we learn is don't do things that hurt. Uh, and is that different than learn the perfect backhand, forehands, something else? What what's going on there? No, so 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 it's exactly the same mechanism. Okay. And I, you know, I, I I hear you because you know, in in raising kids, um, you know, the, the guideline is if you're looking at something they're doing, you want it to be, you want to evaluate that is going to be just painful enough to be a life lesson, but not not bad enough to actually hurt you. So um, when when your brain does something that has a good result then it activates mechanisms that reinforce those connections. When your brain does something that leads to pain, then it activates mechanisms that, that, uh, that make those networks less likely to fire together in the future. So it's, it, it's the same effect. It's all neuroplasticity. All right. I'm, I'm getting the neuroplasticity angle. It's a huge part of, of Headstrong. My book was about how do I increase my own neuroplasticity. And certainly one of the technologies is... Uh, electrical stimulation, mm -hmm. but it seems like the the ability to acquire a new language, let's say, is such a far cry from you know, learning how to walk or learning how to not fall on sharp things and, and things like that. At what point does learning stop being about pain avoidance and start becoming something that's more about skill acquisition? And and what motivates those those neurons to do that? How do we take control of that? Well, so the the cool thing here is that is that doing something well is so deeply satisfying and that it's it's wired into us you know you, you know that feeling you have when you when you execute on that perfect that perfect tennis stroke and okay. that feeling you have if you're if you're learning a language and you get out there and you say something right and you're out there and it's it's this enormously pleasurable feeling and so that sensation of learning and doing something well that's the reward that causes that feedback that reinforces reinforces the connections that led to that great outcome. I'm going to go back to pretty much my entire experience in school. And people appeared to want me to learn stuff that I just didn't really care about and it had no usefulness to me whatsoever. And by the way, if you're one of my teachers back then, I'm sorry, but I'm actually right. Most of what you were teaching me wasn't that useful, although I appreciate all of your service in putting up with my crap. Uh, but in all seriousness, you know, I don't really care what year someone did something 500 years ago. All I care about is why they did it. Right. But they never taught me the why. They just wanted me to memorize crap. Right. So how do you make yourself in your career as an adult or as a teenager, how do you make yourself learn stuff you don't want to learn? Yeah, and, and it's it's hard and it's uh you know it's it's focus. And one of the one of the brain mechanisms that comes into this is what's called cognitive control. And that is something that that we are absolutely better at right now than we were when we were kids. In a lot of ways, our brains are in a lot of ways, our brains are, um, it's getting harder to have them do what we want. You know, neuroplasticity goes down over time, reaction time, all these things. But but one thing that we do tend to get better at is, is cognitive control because our, our frontal lobes, have, they, they spent the first 25 years of our lives developing. And cognitive control is, the, is your brain's ability to focus on what you want it to focus on instead of necessarily what, what it wants to focus on or the view out the window or whatever. So is this part of that with age comes wisdom with, yeah, with, with, with age comes wisdom, you know, if you, and again, you know, there, there's, there's plenty of stuff that does tend to go down 
as time goes by. But if you look at the plots, he's, um, working memory decreases, reaction time decreases, um, ability to pack stuff into short-term mem- memory decreases. The one thing that stays constant is is knowledge of the world, and that's you know that, that's what we'd call wisdom. You know, and that that's why. You know, you picture picture the old silverback gorilla who's still able to keep up and know some sneaky tricks to uh, to to keep to keep the dominance. That that's the silverback gorilla. We're we're, we're the silverback gorillas here. Uh, you know, having this this life life uh, uh, world knowledge. All right, so our brain performance goes down over time. At least mm-hmm. if you don't do something about it. My my experience, just from my own measurements, I have let's see, my hippocampal volume is eighty seventh percentile. So it's not shrinking the way it's supposed to shrink. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I age, my reaction time on EEG to audio and video or uh, visual stimuli is exactly that of a 20 year old. Mm-hmm. I get more sleep in, well, last night, five and a half hours than the average 20 year old gets in eight hours. Mm-hmm. And my working memory, I've trained that. Mm-hmm. So it's highly functional, probably better functioning than most 20 year olds as well. Right. So all of these things are exercisable. There are things you can make the brain do if you have, is it cognitive control you have to have in order to do that? Or is it willpower? And some of these, some of this training is mm-hmm. annoying or it takes time. Mm-hmm. But what what it enables people to decide that they're going to, to push themselves, whether it's physically or mentally, in order to do training on things like that? Right, right. You know, so, so part of it is cognitive control, which I think is just kind of another name for willpower. Um, and the ability to focus, uh, you know, part of it is, part of it is relevance. Um, if it's always easier to learn something or train or practice anything, if you feel like it's relevant to, to, to relevant to what you're doing every day, relevant to some goal that you actually care about. All right, let's talk about relevance. Then you have more than 50 patents in your name. And so you've been pretty successful in biomedical engineering. Um, but, uh, you're also a singer songwriter. (laughs) <laughs> that's uh, right that's right where's the relevance here like, like why why do you do both of those things you know i so i um I, I i guess there's a couple answers to that um you know i it's 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 communication and communication is fun and one yeah. thing i realized about myself is to, to bring this back to learning um i'm what's called a uh, what i call a, perf- a performing introvert meaning i the, everything about you know, how to kind of get out there and communicate that, you know, there, there's people that that comes naturally for. And, you know, again, I, I, I look at my nine year old and that comes naturally to her. It comes naturally to my wife. Um, it, for me, it was more of a learned skill. And part of that was just the, the enjoyment of the more you get out there, the more you use this, the, the more fun it is to communicate. And that, that's what, that's what music is for me. You know, I, I, uh, I lived in New Orleans for a long time and I was, I did the singer songwriter thing in the nineties and played at the, played at the bars and the coffee shops and everything and wrote some songs. And, um, you know, and it was, it, it's all, it's all communication. And, you know, it gave this, you know, this feeling of kind of, uh, you know, putting it out there and connecting with people. So it's, it's the joy of skill acquisition is what drives you to do that. Yeah. The, the, the joy of skill acquisition and then using that skill. Cause yeah. you know, when, when you're, when you're, when you're writing a song, you're, you're creating, you know, you're, you're creating something and it, there's, there's a whole ton of neuroscience behind that as well. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and the creative process is, um, part of it is where you're generating ideas and you want to take the filter off. And then part of it's where you're evaluating those ideas and you're discarding the 99% of those song lyrics that are just crap. And you put the filter on a little bit and then you come out with that by pairing taking the filter off and putting it back on, you end up with something creative. And then you put that together with the, the pleasure of learning, learning the chord progression, learning everything, just being able to put it together, then execute on it. That's that it's one of the most fun feelings that you, that you could possibly have. Do you find that there's a, a crossover between the physical movement things and, and halo is known for enhancing the motor cortex with electrical stimulation. So you get better physical skills, but we also know that the brain works better and improves anytime you have more muscles, you, anytime you move more, the brain increases function. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the neurostimulation for what it does for your physical movement is also has an effect on your personal singer songwriter abilities? Is there a crossover? Yeah. So, so, so yes, yes is the short answer. And, and just to be really clear, I'm asking about your experience, not a, a claim on your product because you do work for Halo. So yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So so you know, personally, there there's a couple things there. So one is, as as a musician, the the more you dial in the technical aspects of what you're doing, if you're able to grab for that, you know, 
a fifth diminished chord exactly where you want it and your fingers just know what to do, then, then you can be free to be creative and express and improvise. And then if, if you turn to other brain targets, and again, this, this is from personal experience, um, you know, the, the brain, the brain is more than just movement and you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's nerve stimulation or all these other principles of learning, um, you know, the, the same applies to, to, to learning the lyrics and learning, learning how to perform and all, all these other things that your brain, that your brain learns. Do you use neurostimulation every day on yourself? So, so I don't use it every day, um, mostly because I don't, I don't have time to train every day. And um, so I use it, I use it for climbing, and I use it for piano, and I use it a couple times a week for those. Um, and for me, it's all about, it's all about getting more out of less. Because you know, like, like you, like, like a lot of people, um, it, we don't have infinite time to train. You know, the the, la- the last time, the last time I had infinite time to train was when I was, you know, when I was six and time had no meaning and I, you know, I could go out and you know p- you know practice with the the soccer ball or you know practice piano all day long so it it, it helps get it help gets helps get more out of limited time when i talk about using neurostimulation uh the way that i use this and I'm, now we're talking specifically about the halo sport uh, which is the thing that you helped to invent uh this thing you put it on and you do something for 20 minutes. And what I've done, my kind of ritual is, um, I will put it on and I'll hang out and make coffee with my son. Mm-hmm. And while, while my brain is doing that 20 minutes, it's sort of connect time. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the 20 minute neuropriming period, there's an hour of enhanced neuroplasticity. Then I go down to the ping pong table and, and I kick his ass. <laughs> and by the way, Alan, who, who probably is listening to this, yeah, I know you win it more than half the time, but you know, I'm not gonna admit that on the air, all right. but. Uh, um, I, I found I could not keep up the way 10 year olds. I mean, we started playing when he was maybe six. Mm-hmm. I would play with my left hand. I'm not left handed just to make it kind of fair. And it's to the point where if I play all out, we're very evenly matched. Mm-hmm. The problem is he's 10. He's not done being neuroplastic. He keeps continuing. And I found that the only way that I could even be a challenging opponent was if I did neuropriming. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll actually do neuropriming and I'll start playing. And after that 20 minute period, um, I'll feel it kick in. It's like the ball slows down, and oh, there, like now I can hit it, and it's it's a very tangible thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is kind of cool because years. In fact, you started Halo in 2013, right? Back in 2010, 2011, when the first TDCS research was coming out. TDCS, by the way, uh, just stands for transdermal cranial stimulation, the ability to run uh, an electrical current through a specific part of the brain. So I. I looked at this and I bought a, a device that was not meant for doing that. It was meant for driving drugs through the skin. Mm-hmm. And I said, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this. It was called the, the Chattanooga. That's and the it was, one. That's it was the one. quite expensive and really inconvenient to use. But uh, I said, I'm going to do archery with this thing. <laughs> the problem was by the time I pasted these electrodes on, they were falling off my head. I never actually did it more than five or six times because it wasn't convenient and all. And I said, well, this is one of those things where it probably works for snipers and for drone pilots and that kind of skill acquisition because they are using TDCS for those mm-hmm. things. Uh, but then when you came out a couple of years later, I'm like, oh, this is kind of a cool piece of tech because it's just headphones that work. And I started using it. And the reason you know, that I wanted to interview you is, is I've become you know, quite a fan of this because otherwise I can't keep up with my 10-year-old. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I. I got a similar story with with my nine year old, you know, and, and you know, again, I, the learning for physical stuff is it, it's it's the same kind of learning that's going on with you know with cognitive language anything, and you know, I because I, it's all it's all your brain optimizing itself. And I, I had this experience with with my nine year old. Um, she goes to the German school in San Francisco, and and partially because we weren't fancy enough to get into the French school, and par- and, <laughs> and and partially because uh, you know she was just a you know just tuned to language from day one. Um, and yeah, you know, and I watched her. Um, I watched her just come home, and you know, it, it felt like in a couple months she was just fluent in German. And wow. and I, and I said, to him, I, I, we put her, we put her in the school, and I said to myself, I, you know, we're we're going to learn German. It's going to be fantastic. We're you know, we we don't speak German. You know, the last German speaker was my was my great grandfather. And uh, and and we had we had every ambition of all right, we're going to learn this right along next to her. Nope. You know, and, and she, you know, she talks smack about me in German. She comes home, she chat, talks to her friends. You know, they're probably talking smack to me even more in German. And, uh, you know, it, you know, you just, you watch, you watch a kid learn and it's, it, it's, it's this amazing thing. And it's because number one, they have, they have the time. Number two, they have the focus. And, you know, depending on, 
depending on how you parent, they don't have as much of the, you know, you don't have the phone with the work emails popping up every five minutes if you're a kid. And, you know, their their neuroplasticity is just is just dialed in from day one because they've got this this brain whose whole job, whose whole reason for existence is just soaking in information and learning skills. That is, uh, it, it's amazing to watch what they can do. But you talked about language. So... I have an auditory processing unusual brain, and I've quantified this. There's narrow narrow spectrums of sound that I don't hear the same in each ear, and it means that my auditory filtering is, is just different. And when I hear people speak French and Swedish, my wife is Swedish and speaks French, um, it sounds, I, I don't hear the sounds, it just sounds like mush. She can say a word to me, and I'll say a different word back. It, it, it does not, it does not land in my brain. Mm -hmm. and that's always kind of pissed me off. So I did a couple different experiments. One is I used one of the very first infrared light stimulators for the brain specifically. It was this homemade little rickety thing. And I put it over my language processing center above the left ear. And I spoke in garbled words in English for the next several hours. It scared the crap out of me. Like, Man, I make my business in tech communicating and all of a sudden I'm garbled. Fortunately, it got better. And I also tried running that ancient TDCS device before you came out with something <laughs> usable <laughs> over that same part of my brain. It didn't make me speak garbled, but I still couldn't do crap with French. Mm -hmm. So here's my question. When I'm stimulating my motor cortex, which is what the Halo Sport does today, uh, is there anything I can do to make reading better, to make memory acquisition or your memory storage better or to make my language, my hearing better, make my vocabulary better? Are, are there any benefits to just running a current there or is this just for the motor cortex? So so same technology, different part of the brain. So you move the electrodes around. Exactly. Yeah. So there, so, so there, there have always been in if you look if you look back at the, the all the scientific background here, there there have always been two main clusters of great results and data. And and one of them is movement, primary motor cortex. And you know that's um, you know it that's the easiest to hit with something that looks like headphones, but the other cluster of data here is in prefrontal cortex. That, that's where I always put it. So right, I got to ask you this: mm -hmm. I'm holding out this cool set of headphones with little rubbery combs on it that get through your hair. Couldn't I just take my halo and wear it like like a stupid headband instead of like a proper set of headphones and stimulate my prefrontal cortex? I, I know this probably isn't the look you were going for, but <laughs> can 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 I do this? So it, it's it. You're it's, allowed to say no because you're not allowed to say yes. No, so so it, it's it's hitting the right part of your brain. You know that that <laughs> that will that will hit prefrontal cortex. And you know, as 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 a product designer, I'm going to step back and say, um, it, wait wait for Halo to. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tease I'm gonna tease this a little here. I'm gonna say wait for Halo to come out with something that is a prefrontal cortex stimulator and might be able to do exactly what you want and look good at the same time. All right, it's very important that when I'm stimulating my brain that I look attractive. Um, I slept with uh, an EEG sleep monitor on my head for several years, the, the old Zio and the, the very earliest. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. been tracking my sleep for more than 10 years, and a lot of the sleep hacking posts out there are copies of my original sleep hacking stuff. And I got to say, Victoria's Secret did not approve that model of headset, a big blue, <laughs> stupid neoprene thing right. and all that. But I, I mean, it, it's nice. You, you actually have really good industrial design on Halo. Just I, I was CTO of one of the wristband companies that does monitoring called Basis. So it, that that's all good. But I'm not sure most of us really even care. I mean, if you make me a little bit smarter and I have to look dumb for 20 minutes as I'm driving or something, I, I wouldn't care. But if you can make it cool, all right, how soon do I get that? You know we're we're uh, we're we're working on it. Put it right. that way. And 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 Dave, we uh, um, you know, we you you might you might just get a sneak preview of that. And oh, uh, that'd we be terrible. We, and and we, and we might be looking at you to help beta test that. I would love to be a beta tester. Um, I I envision a world because I live in it, <laughs> um, a world where it's not as hard as we think it is to do all sorts of stuff, and you can increase energy in the brain and, and a lot of my work, how do I make the cells make more energy? But running a current through your brain also adds energy to your brain. Mm -hmm. And there's questions in neuroscience about how are electrons from an external source used? And we know from light that they actually can enter the electron transport chain. But do you think that we're going to end up in a future five years from now or something where we say, oh, great, you're 10 years old, put on this 
halo hat or you don't need it because you're 10, but you're 18 and you wanted to do this. So put this on and run this piece of software and it's going to be way easier than it was before. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, you know that with with a ten year old, they're they're so plastic and just so good at learning in the first place. Yeah, you know, that that's further off. But uh, you know, some somebody somebody who's eighteen, somebody who has an an adult brain, there's there, there's so much room to there's so much room to improve focus and attention and the ability to learn. You know, the the, the potential of the brain is really is really limitless. You've got hundred billion neurons and a hundred trillion synapses to optimize there. And one of the things about this field is we're we're learning so fast how all this works under the hood and there's really some groundbreaking uh groundbreaking discoveries even just this year about how how this interacts with the fundamental neuroscience and the fundamental mechanisms of, of how your brain processes information that seemed like a bit of a dodge so I mean, we're five years now you're saying we're not gonna do it with kids mm -hmm. so we're learning some more but are we really going going to just say, okay, today I want to do X, so I'm going to stick this thing on my forehead or you know, behind my ear or wherever else. Is this is this going to be a normal thing or is this going to be the domain of pro athletes and Hollywood people want to memorize their lines better? Like, is, is this really a consumer tech? You know, I so 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 I'll give you the, I'll give you the simple answer. Yes. Um, okay. You know, it's so sure. Five years out, it, it it's it's probably going to still be somewhere on the adoption curve, but but the fact is. Everybody at the end of the day wants their brains to work better, and everybody has points in their life where they need to get to get more from uh, get more from the limited time that they have to learn or to train or whatever. And we're we're learning so fast, so much about how this works. That that's why I mentioned that this when I answered before. If five years from now we're going to know exactly the the waveform to deliver that is best for whatever whatever category of stuff you want to learn and you're going to be able to dial that up it's you're, we're going to be able to pair it with training content learning content optimize the stimulation for your personal electrophysiology optimize the stimulation for the ebb and flow of your training um, dial it in and 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 adapt it depending on how well you're doing all all that all that's going to be in the cards and that's that's going to happen in the next decade and and I, I think we're going to be seeing that five years from now what do you say to the uh, the Waldorf parents? By the way, uh, my kids are at Waldorf school. Uh, so, what do you say to the Waldorf parents who are saying technology, uh, kids, or even adults? Th this is unnatural. It, it's cheating. Uh, what's wrong with learning the old-fashioned way through repetition? Yeah. So, you know that that's that's still a great way to learn. But th the thing about the thing about this technology, and I, I'm, I'm, we we call it neuropriming. Um, mm -hmm. The, the thing about this technology is you're still leveraging the brain's natural mechanisms of learning. And those are so powerful and so effective that it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to disrupt those. You know, th this isn't the, it's not the matrix. We're not downloading Kung Fu into your brain. Um, you know, it's it's using technology to make sure that your brain is dialed in and ready to use its natural learning mechanisms where and when you want it. And that's, you know, what you know, if you're I'll, I'll, I'll use a. a, a athlete metaphor here you know I, uh, I was a rower in college and um you know i know when i got the most benefit out of my workouts whether it was cognitive or physical it was when i was just completely dialed in i was engaged i was ready to be neuroplastic and ready to focus but i i sure as hell did not have i was not dialed in every 5 a.m practice i was dialed in a fraction of those so being able to bring that where and when you want it that's that, that's huge and so you're leveraging the natural learning mechanism of your brain Okay, so it's different than downloading Kung Fu, which is sad because if you could do that, I'd totally sign up for that. Like, likewise, that be, give, give me twenty years for that one. All right, twenty years for that one. Uh, there's there's something about in in my perspective on all this about respecting your time here on Earth. Mm -hmm. like, look, you could learn it twice as fast in exactly the same way. The end results are the same. Mm -hmm. Then why wouldn't you do it faster? And that's why. I, I do my meditation with a computer telling me how to do it better and deeper and faster. So I can, I can say, hurry, meditate right, right. <laughs> with legitimacy. And I think what you're saying is if you're going to bother exercising, you might as well make your brain more neuroplastic. So the exercise will stick better and you'll, you'll, you'll improve faster. Right. Right. Now, what do you say to the people who say, well, um, what, what is the halo now? What does it cost? It's, Costs uh, three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. Okay, 
And by the way, that, that price isn't real for Bulletproof uh, radio listeners because, uh, and, and thank you uh, for doing this, you're offering $100 off for everyone uh, who listens to the show and uses code Dave at checkout. So that's a, a massive saving. So now it's $300 or slightly under. So there's people are going to say, well, how is it that you know some athletes have a $400 device and other athletes don't have access to this technology. Aren't we creating a, a divide where you know, only the people who can afford to learn can learn quickly? Well, you know, the, 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 thinking about access like that, sure, it's always part of the conversation with the new technology. But if, if, you go into, if you go into any gym where people are seriously training and you look around, if, if, there's a, if there's a rack of Halo Sport in that gym, those Halo Sports might be the, the, the single cheapest thing in the gym. You know, there's... Yeah. You know, there, there's, you know, there, there's, there's technology in, in these gyms and performance labs that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I, I have that upgrade labs thing down in LA. It's, it's a lot of money for that kind of gear. So you're saying, look, if you go to a gym, you're spending a hundred bucks a month, mm -hmm. right? And there are people who can't afford to go to a gym and they go to the park and, or they don't have time to exercise or whatever. Right. But, um, that there's always, always advantages and disadvantages. It's a spectrum. Uh, and four hundred dollars is within the realm of consumer uh, possibility, especially if it doubles your workout effectiveness. Right. right. Uh, so then the ROI is very high on it. I I do find I'm about two to three times a week is just because of the amount of time that I travel and the amount of time that I'm home and there's ping pong available and all that. <laughs> um, what is the optimal amount of brain stimulation like uh, that that you would say for for the average human? So the you know th this is one of those things where we turn to the science mm -hmm. and the with with brain stimulation with anything with the brain anything with your brain or body. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't want to train by running a marathon every day. And at some point there's, there's a point of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the science, what the science squarely backs up is using this once a day on the order of say, say every day, five days a week, um, two or three days a week is perfectly fine. Um, we don't really know where the point of diminishing returns is. Um, some of the science suggests if, you know, if you do, if you do longer than a 30 minute session, which, which we don't recommend, we don't let you do, then, then there's probably some diminishing returns. Is there harm? So there, there's, there, there's no, there's no evidence of harm. There's, um, you know, any kind of training, if you use it past that point of diminishing returns, it, it might be, um, it, it, it certainly might, it might not be a good use of your time. It might be counterproductive. Uh, there's, there's, there's no, there's no harm. There's no harm. Okay. So that's, that's a good thing. Having a good safety bar makes, right. makes it a good decision to do something. I, for, for 20 years have done electrical brain stimulation before TDCS was created. The Russians pioneered alternating current across the brain right. as right. part of the space program. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's real expensive to send an astronaut to space and then they sleep a third of the time. Why don't we just get rid of as much sleep as we can so we can use less rocket fuel? Mm -hmm. That's a very Russian and very cool way of thinking <laughs> about solving a problem. And so they have this alternating current thing and you could do that to sleep better. So I said, all right, I've been working on hacking my sleep and I used to suck at sleep. So there were times when I would sleep for only three hours a night, but I'd run you know, 1.5 Hertz current back and forth through my ears and I'd wake up feeling amazing. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what just happened? This is totally not what I would have expected. Uh, and for hangover uh, uh, cures, uh, I've, uh, I've definitely seen results from both TDCS and alternating current. And I may or may not have given my halo to a friend who was hungover and seen that they felt way better after 20 minutes. I, I will file that away and we're gonna have to work on some waveforms for that. There, I, I imagine there probably are some that would be more effective than that, but it was, it was actually really profound. Mm -hmm. uh, the one case, the person was wrecked. And I said, well, why don't you try some brain stimulation? And it, literally in, in 10 minutes, it was like, oh, I'm fine now. I, I'm good to go. And, and it, it was someone flicked the light switch back mm -hmm. on. Neurologically, biochemically, bioengineering wise, what's going on with the electricity in the brain and effects like that? Yeah. So, um, you know, so you mentioned AC. So, and this is one of the most exciting things in the whole field right now, because, um, Oh, just to be clear, we use uh, direct current. We use the halo sport, um, in the case I'm talking about there, but it, I've used a, I've used my old alternating current stuff from the nineties yeah, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the, so, so the mechanism for any of this, um, when, when you deliver an electric current to the scalp, Enough of that makes its way through the scalp, through the skull. Those electrons, uh, those electrons in the form of ions, once they get into your into your scalp and into your body, they create an electrical field around your neurons. 
And what that electrical field does, whether it's AC or DC, all, all of those neurons are participating in the same electrical field because it spreads out over that patch of brain. So what you're doing there is when you've got a moderate electrical field over all these neurons, it makes them more likely to fire together because they're all participating in the same electrical field. Now, if it's AC or DC, it does that. It does that a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, you're helping neurons fire together. And that's the whole mechanism of how, of how your brain optimizes itself and how synapses change and rearrange themselves. Well, that'll drive you know, synaptogenesis, you know, growing new synapses and things like that. The other part of learning, though, especially skill acquisition at expert levels, is myelinogenesis, growing myelin, the electrical insulation around nerves like that. Mm -hmm. And some forms of electrical stimulation uh, will, we know, increase myelin. And essentially, the more electrical current the nerve has to carry, the more the body says, maybe I should insulate that one. And when it's insulated, you're right. more of an expert. What I don't know, what I'm asking you now is, is the amount of current that comes from halo enough to drive myelin formation, or is this just about synapse formation? So, so the amount of current that's coming from that's coming from halo or, or, or any kind of technology like this yeah. is um, it's it's probably not enough to directly drive myelin formation. Although I, I, I got to say I'm not I'm not an expert in that okay. in that part of this. Um, but what it what it does drive is it drives it drives this synchronous neural firing which synaptogenesis is only part of it because part part of the changes that happen you have the structural change of generating new synapses but the way all of the fine tuning happens is the strength of all of these 100 trillion synapses is constantly being adjusted so that when when you get a signal from one neuron the next one along is either more or less likely to fire and that that actually that happens way faster than synaptogenesis, and that that's actually the core mechanism of how your brain optimizes itself. Now, once you have enough of that happening, you can get synaptogenesis, you can get different patterns of firing, and then that can drive the myelin the the, the myelination that you're talking about. Okay, that that makes a lot of sense. And the, the more they're firing, the more you're going to get it. The things that I'm familiar with that drive myelin specifically are more uh, peripheral nerves. Right. So some of the electrical stimulation gear that I have that it feels like. Your whole your body's kind of being hit with a taser. <laughs> right. That stuff will definitely drive myelin. It, it's it's kind of rid ridiculous what some of it does, but it's it's intense. Right. I don't think I'd want to put that on my brain. Right. Uh, Although the Russians probably have, like fifty I'm years ago. Certain they have. <laughs> um, if it wasn't the Russians, it was the East Germans. Right. right. That's where, in fact, a surprising number of of pieces of research about electricity in the brain have come from Russia and East Germany. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? You know, the, every, every culture has a different approach to science. And I, I think there's, there's something that there's something that resonates with the Soviet scientific mind. Yeah. It's like, let's, you know, let, let's, let's, let's put electrodes on it. Let's see what happens. I, I very much appreciate that mindset. I think it's cool. And you look back in the field, the, that Russian stuff was late 60s, mm -hmm. but there weren't a lot of papers, at least not a lot of English papers. But in the last 15 years, uh, how much research is there around not just reading electricity from the brain? Because there's lots of that, but actually mm -hmm. putting electricity into the brain. Is yeah. it dozens of papers or is there's a little bit more? I mean, it, it, it's thousands. There's uh, 4,000 plus papers at this point. And, okay. You know, and, and the the whole modern field got kind of uh, um, re-kicked off in uh, 1999 by a uh, um, uh, German team, actually, at the University of Göttingen. And they they basically said, hey, look at motor cortex. We can create these really, really reliable, robust effects and see it, see it happen time after time again in this person and that person and the next person. Okay, so what do we do with this? It's clearly neuroplasticity. So then um, if scientists all over the world started picking this up, showing that you can use it to accelerate benefits from from training or learning and you know now so now we're standing at a point where um not just dc but ac and something called trns which uses a broad spectrum random noise uh it's 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 been out there in in the world of science for uh you know, you know kind of a, a long time in uh, you know in, te in technological terms it's funny at 40 years of zen which is the the neuroscience company that i started that you know, five days intensive work with custom neuroscientists working on your brain we use uh, ac uh, on the brain as a, a small part it's mostly neurofeedback based but to get the brain ready we'll use ac on the brain just alternating current 
uh, back and forth instead of just through one part of the brain, and we'll use the random noise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the effects are really profound. The problem is it takes a huge amount of clinical gear, and it's something we do in order before we do certain kinds of neurofeedback or other personal development oriented training. So I, I've seen the effects. I actually have the clinical grade gear at home to mm-hmm. do that stuff, mm-hmm. but you can't really buy that unless you have some sort of license. Like this this is not the sort of stuff. Um, but I'm I'm really interested in in the effects. Mm-hmm. So is this something that might be coming from you guys? I, I you know, especially as we turn to uh, turn to cognitive applications, um, I, I'm I'm going to say yes. Uh, you know, the a lot of the a lot of the best, most recent data in using frontal stimulation, you know, using this for learning and memory and things like that. Um, it's it, it's using alternating currents. Well, there was a study, the New York Times reported on it, which is really cool. Like, what are the odds of brain electrical stimulation, neurostimulation ever being in the New York Times? You go back 10 years, this was the era of science fiction and just mm-hmm. craziness. And now it, it's it's not just real, it's being recognized as real. Right. And the study that I'm thinking of showed that this alternating current across the brain improved working memory in older adults, so they perform the same as young adults. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, this, so this was a, a group at Boston University, okay. and the uh, Rob Reinhart and uh, uh, Jonathan Nguyen, if I remember his name correctly. And so they, and it was just, it was a beautiful study because it was one of these studies where they, so they did, they did, they did the thing, first of all, they did the thing that um, everybody tries to do when they do the science, which is they show, okay, this works. Alternating current stimulation made working memory better. But then they took, they, they, did, they did a few other things. They, they looked at the, the EEG and what's called phase amplitude coupling. They showed that when you see this working, you also see an increase in phase amplitude coupling. They compared it with younger participants and showed that, okay, this doesn't work as well in younger individuals because there's not as much headroom to, to get better. Then they stimulated, they stimulated opposite to the way they showed work, and they showed, okay, look, you know, we, we can make people a little worse by stimulating the other way, which you know, it's not super useful out there in the world, but it's a huge part of the science. Oh, it, it's really useful to be able to make people worse. Uh, one of the things that that drove me down the neuroscience interest path that I have is I got my first EEG machine in 1997 mm-hmm. and started doing things to my own brain. Uh, the problem is, though, doing brain surgery on yourself is usually a bad idea. Right? <laughs> that, that, that's a good rule to live by. <laughs> right? And so you realize your perception of reality can be changed. And I mean, I had one time just not that long ago where... I didn't take the time to properly seat two of the electrodes. And I was doing some really advanced, you know, off, off the record brain training sort of, sort of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do train protocols that are there for, you know, advanced states of consciousness and human performance that aren't, I, I would aren't expect on the no less. But man, I had two electrodes loose, so I wasn't getting a signal from them. I was a zombie. I mean, for three days, I couldn't, I, I, I was just dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. And that's why I have a couple of neuroscientists working for me as well. So I'm like, let's troubleshoot this. And we looked at the record of the training and realized the electrodes were loose. So we actually uptrain those parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. But the moral of the story is that if you can use the technology to make someone worse, it means it takes someone like you with you know 50 patents and you've studied neuroscience for a long time to figure out how to do this not just in a study somewhere, mm-hmm. uh, but to do this on a large number of people's brains and to do it in a way that's going to be beneficial by making phase coupling happen. So I I would like to have that so I can wake up in the morning instead of strapping on a bunch of gear from a neuroscience lab with Velcro and goop and all that crap to be able to just put on a Halo headset and say, make my brain act like a young brain today. Yeah. yeah. How long is it gonna be till I can do that? So, so, so we're on it. All right, you're we're working on it. on it. We're on it. Yeah, that's uh, you know, and and you don't have to give me a launch date, but we're talking in the order of a year or two, not five years. Yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're I I think we're talking a year or two here. Okay, and um, you know, what's that's that's exciting on its own, and you know, just talking about kind of what the future holds here. Um, that what what we and you know, kind of everybody in the field, I think, will have in five years is 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 the ability to not just deliver this neurostimulation. But to but to personalize it because mm-hmm. you know, one one of the one of the key principles of interacting with the brain is you've got to close the loop, and that's actually what my co-founder and I did at our previous company Neuropace was we we were working on implantable neurostimulators for epilepsy. Yeah. Well, you know that neurostimulation works pretty well if you turn it on and leave it on, 
Turns it out, it turns out it works better if you watch for seizures about to start and then you stimulate right when the seizure is about to start. So, you know, it, it turns out that's it's this general principle for, for working with the brain. Everything is better when you personalize it, when you close the loop and you make it responsive. So we have our electrical engineers right now working on things like being able to record biosignals mm-hmm. from the from the headset. You know, that that's that's not wow. today, it's not tomorrow, it's not, it's not two years from now, but that that's kind of the wave of the future. And then that's the kind of it's the kind of thing that um, you know, not not just us, but everybody out in the field and in academia is thinking about. There's there's been a long standing problem of getting electrical signals off the brain mm-hmm. uh, because when you move, your muscles make electricity that's way stronger than your brain electricity, so you get artifacts all over the place. Right, right. Uh, so if you solve that problem uh, with a pair of headphones, uh, kudos. That that's been a, just a long standing neuroscience yeah, annoyance. Yeah, it, I mean it, it's it, it's a hard problem, and I you know one of one of my uh, biggest moments of chagrin in my scientific career was uh, back. So I, my PhD was in uh, EEG and electric fields in the brain, and and back in uh, 1998, I I spent about a week thinking I'd made a, just an earth shattering discovery of <laughs> you know there's this there's the synchrony and it happens in the temporal lobes and it happens when uh, you know we were watching people um, doing mental subtraction and this was this was when everybody in the field was starting to if, first starting to appreciate a lot of what synchrony between different parts of the brain mean. And I, I thought, I mean, I thought this was like Nobel prize material. I mean, I, it, and then, and then we realized this was, so this was a participant who was, um, they, they, they had uh, math anxiety and they were clenching their teeth <laughs> when they were doing this mental calculation. And it, and it wasn't even brain. It was, it was their temporal muscles um, with this, with all this highly coherent activity because they were clenching their jaw. Artifacts are just the bane of of anyone's existence who works on this. People listening to the show be like, what the heck is an artifact? But here's the thing. If we're working on a signal, you're working on, on increasing motor function with running a current, and you think you're getting increased motor function, but you're not because of bad data, for example, it's it's a massive problem in science. And even things like fMRI, which is a way we've been looking at people's brains, they just noticed that the algorithms used for pretty much all fMRI research for the past <laughs> 15 years were wrong. Right. So all right. these neuroscience conclusions were, were wrong. So the ability to actually get a real picture of what's going on in the brain so you can perform it, it is really hard work. But you've right. done way more work on it than I have. How hopeful are you that we're going to actually get good signals of what's going on in the brain when we're just going about our daily business? You know, it, it's it, it's it's hard, but it's doable. Um, okay. You know, the, there's everybody everybody in the field has learned a lot more about what does artifact look like. How do you how do you separate it out? And you know, so much of this is understanding. Um, you can't always get good signals, but what you, what you got to be able to do is understand when are we getting a good signal and when aren't we. Because it's okay if they're not great signals all the time. You've just got to be able to understand when is it good so you can draw your conclusions from that. Okay, so the ability to parse out the bad stuff. I've worked with a developer um, at 40 Years of Zen to say, mm-hmm. all right, how do we identify a bad signal just to just cut that out? Like, I, right. I just don't want that. And I think there's lots of neuroscientists all over the place looking at machine learning and different ways to, to get that out. You guys clearly have the ability to know what's going on in the brain because you're an expert and because you, we just walked through the labs, I've, I've seen all your gear there. So you have the ability to say, all right, we're gonna stimulate the brain and see what the brain does, which is super cool. I just, I want the day when I can get a on my my iPad, I can say, oh, here's what my kid's brain's doing, here's what my brain's doing. Right. Yeah, right. Here's what all of our employees' brains are doing. And wow, <laughs> they're all in chaos. Like maybe we could maybe we could do something about that, not in an invasive way, mm-hmm. but in a in a helpful way. I don't want to read people's minds, although that'd be fun too. Uh, but I what I'd like to be able to do is be like, this person's like seriously not in a good place. Maybe we can just say, why don't you take the day off? Like, like wouldn't that mm-hmm. be awesome? Yeah, but right now yeah. we we don't have the signal. Right. Right. And if we did have the signal, there's probably some, you know. So a whole bunch of privacy and, and ethical questions and things like that. But the bottom line is if you own your signal and you can say, all right, I'm getting a red alert on my phone that says mm-hmm. my brain is jacked today. Maybe I'm going to do something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's, we're painting a picture of the future that, that could either be really dark or really, really beneficial. Uh, but along the way, the ability to learn in less time is, I don't think there's any ethical questions about that that, that are credible. People will say, well, it's not fair, it's cheating, whatever, um, using clothes to stay warm is also cheating. So we're gonna just let those let, let the Luddites die, that's what happens to them. 
I want to talk about some of the cool new stuff that you're working on with, with Halo. Yeah. I talked about language acquisition, which is actually really a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. But we also mentioned music. And right. you're doing something now specifically to study neuroscience and music. What are you doing with Halo around that? Right, right. So we uh, we have this per partnership with uh, with Berkeley College of Music, and it's the it's the Berkeley in Boston, not the Berkeley just across the bay. Um, yeah, obviously, legendary music school, and we we actually kicked that off this summer. And the the way we started was we we offered a fellowship for music students, um, a couple from Berkeley, Stanford, um, to come here and do some experiential work and some controlled studies using neurostimulation for music performance for songwriting actually um oh wow yeah we had we had a uh, we had a songwriter and she um uh and she used um not not halo sports she used a different form factor for to increase creativity and she she more than tripled her output of songs because she was able to dial up and dial down down that creative output and the ability to focus through electrical stimulation not feedback uh, through electrical stimulation. That's fascinating. I, I want to learn more about that. I'm intrigued that there might be specific stimulation things that anyone listening to the show could do that would allow them to be better creators. When is this going to be commercially available? Right. Yeah. So, so I'm not pushing on you or anything here. <laughs> no, no, no pressure. Like, sign no pressure. me up. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the answer there is, uh, it's uh, again. This is this is prefrontal cortex. So it's okay. you know it's not it's not today and it's not tomorrow, but it's uh, it's on a roadmap and it's something to be looking for in the next right. uh, in the next year or two. And and again, Dave, um, you're gonna you're probably gonna see it. You're gonna hook me up. All right, that's yeah. good. Because I do you remember there was like a, something. I'm probably going back to the the 90s. And if you were like in a certain gang, you'd put your bandana really low over your forehead. Oh yeah. Yep. All right. So I'm not opposed to taking my current halo and just kind of giving myself that <laughs> kind of mono brow with it. Cause if, if it's going to double or triple my writing output or make me a better podcast interviewer or whatever, I, I would do that right before an episode in a minute. Okay. So that's pretty exciting. And you, you have a long history of working with pro athletes. You're doing some stuff with, um, uh, Titleist performance Institute, which is a, a very well-respected thing in, in golf. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, one one of the things about TPI is, um, you know, they they're 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 all about they're all about using practice time wisely and really, you know, really refi scientifically refining every part of the golfer's the golfer's stroke. Um, uh, Charlie Hoffman, um, you know, just really successful golfer lately. He's a uh, he's a, a pretty dedicated Halo user, and you know, for it, it works for him the you know the the same way it works for you and me, which is helps him get more out of the, the amount of time he has to train because you know, nobody wants to be in there on the driving range uh, you know eight hours a day you plus know. your shoulder wears out you exactly know. yeah and 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 that you know that's one of the key things you know we've we've learned from working with not just professional athletes but uh, with people like US special forces you know we went we when we first started working with special forces and we started talking to these guys and you know, we 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 started the conversation in terms of okay you can you can get better. And they were like, we don't want to get better. We're already at the top of our game. What we want is to be able to, to maintain, maintain this strength and skill with less time in the gym so that our guys have less, less chance of getting injured and can spend more time working on other stuff like you know, these professional skills, learning languages, you know, you know, strategy, all, you know, all the other things that make up their, uh, make up their, their skill set. It sounds like the same thing everyone listening wants. Hold on. Did I want to spend more time doing what I wanted and less time doing stuff to maintain myself? Right. I, I'm all over that. Everything that we do as human beings since the beginning of time has been about saving time and energy right. so you can do what you want. Right. 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 So this is just a continuation of that, even at the highest special forces level. Yeah. Okay. Something we haven't talked about yet. Something that really intrigues me. You mentioned when I was coming into the office uh, in the elevator uh, I didn't realize you'd written some papers on it until I looked through my notes. It's around endurance, which is very different than skill acquisition. Right, right. And you're finding that people actually have muscle, uh, that their muscle fatigue doesn't happen as quickly if their brain is stimulated or they're able to cycle for longer. Tell right, me about what right. you figured out there, because this is groundbreaking. We have a lot of even pro athletes who listen to the show, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the weekend warrior types. Mm -hmm. So what does brain stimulation do for endurance? Yeah. So, so, so there's two parts to that answer. And, and the, the short answer is it, it helps your endurance. It makes it, it makes you, um, it, in, it increases your time to exhaustion. And it also, there, there's this feedback between skill and endurance 
where where that gets compounded if if you bake in your skills into muscle memory more because then then you can keep your form for longer so it takes ele- less electrons to manage them yeah and and you know let me, let me give you an example from my uh, my athletic career i was a, a rower in college which is uh, which was if you know, fantastic and and sometimes brutal and cold and wet but you know an amazing experience but one of the things about any kind of endurance sport is you're you you get out there and you're you're really pushing the limits of your capability and as you do that you get more and more pain more and more fatigue and your technique starts to break down and once that happens the pain starts starts compounding and all of that all of that that you get this cascade of failure when you're at the limits of your endurance and one of the anti- the antidotes to that is to bake everything better and better into your muscle memory so you can keep good technique in the face of that pain and fatigue that's part of the answer. That's a super powerful effect, and that's something that I've seen myself in my own training. The other part of the answer is that endurance is all about your motor cortex's ability to keep firing all of those neurons, to, to keep those systems running, create synchronous output to your muscles, again, in the face of pain and fatigue. And that's something that you can train your motor cortex to do. And by using neurostimulation, you can increase you can actually increase your motor cortex's ability to 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 keep all that going in the face of exhaustion how much longer so the best data show it it's it's incremental but meaningful improvements things like 10 20 30% so you could potentially cycle 20% longer than you normally could right this is if you primed your brain before you cycled or you priming it while you're cycling. Do you have to wear the halo under your under your helmet? How does that work? Yeah, so this, so this would be a, a 20 minute session okay. before before your training. Wow. Okay, so these are very meaningful numbers. What about uh, muscle strength, you know, weightlifting kind of stuff? So so same thing for muscle strength. Um, you know, one one thing that's that's a really cool fact about strength is that when you first go into the gym, like let's let's say you let's say you haven't been training, and you go into the gym and you start a strength training program, you get these immediate gains in strength, and it's not it's not your muscles getting bigger, it's not your physiology changing yet, it's that your brain is actually getting better at sending those signals to your muscles, so you get all the right contractions at all the right times for for a smooth, powerful output. So wow. In the studies you did, did you use the Halo Sport one, the first one that I used, or the brand new the Halo Sport two, which is the one I've been using for about the last six months? So most of the studies were Halo Sport one. Okay, got it. But it's the same waveform and two, just same, two is a better form factor. Form, same name, Zelda. All right. Yeah. The Halo Sport two is more affordable and cooler. Exactly. And you've got what two studies out on this? On, right. Right. Okay. So, it, it, would it be out of line to say if people are listening to the show and they wanted to be able to lift at least ten percent? longer or or so, talking increases in strength or increases in or decreases in the amount of time it takes to get fatigued yeah so 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 both okay. um it, so so they can lift more right right okay and they can go for longer exactly all right so at least a 10 percent improvement is what you found in the study that's so a 10 percent improvement for at least 10 percent improvement for something like uh time to exhaustion okay um the data in strength um you know uh, it, it, it depends on what kind of athlete you are. Okay. If you're, if you're a beginner, then you're going to get better faster. And those gains, uh, those gains are probably going to be on the order of, you know, 10, 20, 30% faster. If you're, if you're an experienced athlete, you know, you're, you're not, you're not going to get 10, 20, 30% stronger. Some cases that would make you superhuman. Uh, yeah. You know, we, you know, we did, we did a study with, uh, with Sparta science, which is this performance center down in, down in Menlo park. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, those guys got, um, you know, three, four or 5% stronger, more explosive on things like vertical leap. That's, you know, if you're, if you're a skilled athlete, that's super meaningful. That is a massive improvement. All right. Well, the, those studies, I think s- just speak for themselves in terms of, of what Halo Sport does for people who really want to move well. I've just found that even the fine muscle stuff, the ability to hit a spin shot, uh, seeing the, the ping pong ball slow down, this is meaningful stuff. And I think it it isn't yet a, a big enough part of the national conversation about hey, if you wanted to improve, you could do this. And there's nothing that says you can't have one halo in your family. Right. right <laughs> you know, you right. share it with people. I haven't let my kids use it though, because I figure I don't really know. Uh, and I'm sure that the insurance companies say you have to be 18 or older for this. Uh, you know, the you know not only not only are kids super neuroplastic and just super good at at 
at learning and training anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if your kid, your skull is thinner, um, you know, you, I mean, sure, you know, sure, you d- your brain doesn't instantly change when you turn from 17 to 18, but uh, you know, we, it, it is intended for adults only. Yeah, it's also not sized for kids. Right. So I've never run electrical stimulation um, on the on the kids. I definitely do feedback training so their mm-hmm. brain can better regulate itself. But it, it feels like this is an adult technology. It is. But, and this is kind of a leading question. I set you up there because your prefrontal cortex doesn't really get baked until you're 24 or 25. Right, right. Is this something for young adults as well? So the so so yes. And one of the reasons I say that is because um, – all of the basically all of the neuroscience literature that's ever been ever been produced studied every study that's been done virtually happens to have been done in neuroscience undergrads and grad students so <laughs> okay that, that's really smart like pretty much they've only tested people in their early 20s right right uh, okay and, and, you i know, got the, you there so, you know there's a lot of studies where you know they've intentionally gone out and done adults but if if there's a result you see in the neuroscience literature it's pro it, it it has probably been shown in people from 18 to about 24. Okay. That is profound. I'm just thinking, have I, I've, I've done neurofeedback on my parents in their seventies. I haven't gone into like their nineties. I've had people come through after their seventies in the training, but I'm just wondering, like, should I go to my grandmother, give her my full stack of cognitive enhancers and then put a halo sport on her to see what she does. So <laughs> she's 97, not, 97. Well, so you know, so I, so I can't, I can't speak for the, uh, the nootropics and the, the, the and, and some of the cognitive enhancers, but I, I can speak to neurostimulation. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about yeah. that. I just feel like it works better if the cells have enough power to like fire up again. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there, there are, um, there are changes that happen late in life. And I think if you, again, if you step back and look at the data, we scientists will look at the data, the, the data get more clear in healthy older adults because they're you know because there's and and I'm, I, healthy older adults up to a certain point you know and the data you know 75 maybe 80 80 looking at results like this you know like this Reinhardt study we talked about because at that point there there's more headroom to improve you you're part of the way into this path of decline in working memory and things like that and there's more need for something to help with it now if if you if you get if you get to somebody who's 95 there are there are changes in you know, there's changes in brain anatomy. There's um, a thicker layer of cerebrospinal fluid, um, and and it puts you in a place where where the data aren't as well baked. Well, it's also there are vanishingly few healthy older adults. Right. Uh, right. So the sample size gets smaller and smaller. As a as a guy with a track record of being right before the study is a good <laughs> amount of the time, i.e. keto and stuff, uh, I would bet on the electrical stimulation as being a beneficial thing to do a couple times a week. In general, as part of a mm. broad spectrum anti aging brain program, well, and, 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 and I've been doing it for twenty years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and you know one of the one of the things about this technology is it's it's best used when you pair it with some kind of cognitive training learning. So you know we're we're not we're not saying don't do the crosswords, don't do the brain training. Take neurostimulation, pair it with yes. high quality, mindful, thoughtful brain training, physical training, and and then and then it's all going to operate synergistically. That sounds like a, a pretty good program for performing well for decades and decades and decades. Well, that was my my final question for you, other than the final final, the which final, is final. bring it. How long are you going to live? I mentioned my number of one eighty. You've got fifty <laughs> patents. You're a bioengineering neuroscientist guy. You know a thing or two. What's your number? How long am I going to live? Um, I really think. I think at least 150 is. Uh, there we go. High five on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- there's, there's so much. We're learning so much. Yeah. And you know, it's it's it, it's the stuff you're working on. It's the stuff that's out there in 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 labs all over the world. And the the yeah. the stuff the stuff that's gonna the stuff that's gonna cure cancer and is gonna fundamentally figure out how to how to reverse these uh, you know th- these cellular processes of aging where you know you have the, the the ends of your you know your telomeres or whatever you're getting you know knocked off bit by bit um the 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 work that is going to nail that it's probably happening literally we're, right now we're hacking all of it and in fact that's one of the seven pillars of aging that I, I write about in superhuman where yeah there are teams making massive progress on all these things and the progress is accelerating 
And heck, let's neurostimulate all the teams doing that and make it accelerate right. even more. But like, it's all it's all feeding back on itself. So I I just don't think you're crazy at 150. It just sounds sounds achievable. So good for you, man. Awesome. Well, I'm look, looking forward to uh, meeting up 100 years from now and uh, comparing notes. Well, if you like today's episode, there's probably a couple things that you want to do. One is you might want to start incorporating neurostimulation into your life because whether you're going to go to a yoga class or do whatever your sport is, or maybe you don't really have a sport because you just exercise a little bit to stay healthy, you are still going to get more per minute out of your exercise if you do it neurostimulated than not. So if you want to do that, go to haloneuro.com, H-A-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com, use code Dave and save $100, which is a meaningful amount of money. And while you're at it, you should be reading Superhuman because if you're not reading Superhuman, you're probably not a superhuman. So you can pick that up anywhere books are sold. And if you were to actually use the Halo Sport while you are reading Superhuman, no one knows what will happen, but maybe you can be the first.